Mark, hey man, it's good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you, Eric. I'm excited to have you back on. I'm excited for the conversation. The last one episode we did um, was well received. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. It was fun. Cool. Well, I hope you had a good holiday. Um, I know we talked a little bit about that before the podcast, but um, I know you, you struggled a little bit. So we'll jump right into uh, some of the content here. I, you know, in doing the Mindset Accelerator for Beating and Blazer and talking with you, um, Juddy and Brandon, we get the same kind of sense that what we're talking about here is a lot of uh, gamifying life. And you talk about that in the Mindset Accelerator quite a bit on how to gamify life and what it means to actually gamify life. Could you give me a little bit of context to help like get the conversation rolling about that? Yeah, I'll tell you the, the that idea of gamifying came to me a couple of different ways. One, <clears throat> you know, we've talked about flow. I know you've talked to Juddy about this as well. And uh, flow really is sort of gamifying life. There's one of the one of my favorite books on this is by a guy named Jesse Shell, who's at Carnegie Mellon. And and the, the essence of it is if you think about how people are game, like video games, um, they're constantly leveling up, but they're doing it in a game fashion. So they don't really think about it like the way we think about most uh, skills. Like if you were being taught how to play piano, you don't do it in a game way. Typically, you do it in a drill way, drill, drill, drill. And that's the way most of us do life, right? But if we could gamify it, if we could make it something that was fun, we could be in flow much more. We could be, and, and that's not just to make it fun. That's actually to accelerate the learning with the whole process. So, so that's kind of one way. The other way is there's a book actually called uh, Level Up Your Life. And, and this is a guy who was a gamer. And he decided to attach some of the gaming um, philosophy to his life. And, and it, it was super cool. It's really simple in concept, but it's a really, really neat way to, to go about it. So for example, for me, I, I want to learn to speak Italian. I want to learn to cook uh, specifically pizzas in a brick oven, right? So, so the end goal, right? The pot of gold is that. So let's go backwards and say, okay, what's the first thing? And the first thing could be learning enough information so that I can go to the Italian American club and order dinner there in Italian, right? So not only do I have a challenge in front of me, but those are an immediate reward after that challenge happens, whether I'm completely successful or not. That's different than me just drilling Italian words, right? Those two paths are very, very different everything about my mindset, everything about my physiology around that is different when I'm doing it as a game versus when I'm doing it as a drill. So that's the essence of it. So would you say that like we're thinking of it as levels? So you have to define what level one is. So for example, I'd like to tie it back to something that right now people are thinking about. So New Year's resolutions, yeah. I think health and fitness, right? That's a really easy one. Everyone throws that on the list. Um, so what would level if we're going to gamify this, like if we're going to gamify health and fitness, something, what would level one be versus level 10? Yeah. So I think it's a great question and it's a very, very important question because what level one is for you may be different than me. So number one, we need to define our own level. You could say on a scale from one to 10, where am I on fitness? Uh, so you can do it that way. I'm a five. I want to get to a seven. Um, but, you know, health and fitness is a great example, <clears throat> excuse me, because you can you can measure this, right? How long does it take me to go a mile? And I say go a mile because maybe it's running, maybe it's walking, maybe it's some combination of those two, right? How much do I weigh? What's my body fat? Um, what's my resting heart rate? Whatever it is that you want to measure, you know, you can use so many different uh techniques and, and apparatus and so forth to be able to measure these things. It's a great example. So you get a baseline and that baseline is you can call that your level one. And so let's say it's a weight situation. I weigh, I'm just going to make this up. I weigh 180 pounds and I eventually want to get to 160 pounds. Okay. So 
the, what normally would happen is I would deprive myself of food. I would work out. I would, you know, these kinds of things. These, this is the equivalent of drilling, right? Drill, drill, drill. But if I said instead, um, you know, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see how many days in a row I can go without eating sweets. And, and each day I'm earning $10 towards a new shirt or something. Right. And so I go three days and I buy a $30 shirt. Okay. So there's, there's a, a, a very clear goal. There's a very clear reward. Some people will go on the punishment side. That's not really my thing. I respond better to rewards, but that's an individual thing as well. Um, and, and then at that point I can buy a shirt or I can, uh, take myself to the movies or I can, whatever it happens to be, right. Whatever your, your reward system is. And so then you can track this out. And the reason, and this becomes really important in the game, the reason I want to lose weight is because I'm going to take myself to the Maldives and watch the pigs swim in the Maldives. Okay. Something like that. And that's going to be in July, right? So this is seven months out. Um, I'm not, by the way, I'm just making this up, but that would be super cool to go do that. Man, maybe I will. We'll see. Um, and so, so the first level is how many days without sweets or how many days in a row do I exercise, which means I'm at least 20 minutes of activity. Okay. You, so you can do it a couple of different ways. And then I reward myself. And, and then I'm now I'm at level two and level two is instead of me walking a mile, I want to get to where I can run a mile. And I reward myself there with maybe a new pair of running shoes and on and on and on. Right. And so my end goal is at 20 pounds, I'm going to the Maldives. Right. So you have these levels that you go through every time and there's a reward at each level. So it's not so much let me deprive myself of food or let me make myself work out. It's when I do this, here's what I get. And that mm. creates a game for it in there. It, and, you know, really thinking about the game, maybe I want to partner with you, Eric, because you decide that you want to exercise as well. And so we get to compete against each other with this. Okay. But compete in a supportive way. So go back to competitive and cooperative communication we talked about last time. We want to cooperate on this to help each other get better. Okay. So I think that thinking about it as levels, like the question that you just asked is really important, but starting with what's my level and what's my level one and what's my level two and what's my level three becomes really important. So that's the hard part, isn't it? I mean, I know for me, it's always been the hard part because you always, you think that your level one is really your level four. Yeah. Right. It's too easy to say that, okay, well I can, you know, fast five days a week, you know, do an intermittent fasting five days a week when I've never done it before. But after day three, you're like, I'm, I'm done. I'm over this. Right. Yeah. So there, Where there's you probably should have said, I'm going to start my intermittent fasting maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right. For a couple of weeks and then add a few more days and then add a few more days. Right. So this gets into a super cool, topic of habits and, and these kinds of things, because really what you're trying to do is create habits around it. So you don't have to use some cognitive load to be able to, and willpower to be able to do this. Right. And so, um, so you're right. And you know, what most people do, you've, I'm sure you've heard this phrase before over promise and under deliver. What most people should do instead is under promise and over deliver to themselves. Mm. Okay, so to your example about fasting, I'm going to fast twice a week. You're going to start doing that. That's going to that's going to create a lot of require a lot of willpower to be able to do that, right? So how about you create some kind of a mini habit around that? I'm going to uh, not eat. I'm going to give myself a, a period of time where I'm not going to eat for ten hours, let's say, which seems like a long time, but if you're sleeping, that's eight of those ten hours. And then I'm going to expand it, right? So you, and, and maybe you go 12 hours that day. Okay, that's fine. You've under promised and over delivered to yourself. And the thing about it is, and, and this becomes really interesting because 
when you overpromise and underdeliver, it demotivates you. When you underpromise and overdeliver, it motivates you. And now you've created this momentum to, to carry you to where you want to go. And then from there, it's about doing the reps. I've, um, so my trainer did this thing to me. I've always, I, I keep, I always mess up my, my ankle and my calf when I do, when I run. So, and I have a trainer and he knows this. Um, but you know, we don't know why it happens or what goes on. So literally what he put into my training protocol was me doing these little baby step jogs. Like I'm talking like an Asian shuffle baby step jogs across the floor, which is maybe, I don't know, it might've been 30 feet where I was doing them. And I, I felt like I felt stupid doing it, right? If it was that small, like not running, not even a jog, it was just these, these little things. And I would do reps of, you know, back and forth like 10 times. Right. And then he would slowly increase it. And now this was part of the program. He never told me that eventually we'd be running, you know, this two mile loop that's right outside of our gym. But eventually I got my calves to a point because this is like a physical thing. Uh -huh. um, so not only did I get my calves to a point where they were able to slowly build up the, um, I guess, the, the pressure from from doing it and my knees because my knee and my hip was all messed up. Eventually they all were like, OK, his body is demanding that we do this. We need to put ourselves together, you know, on top of some mobility protocols and stuff like that. But over time, I was able to run that loop at, with no problem. And it, it happened so fast. So instead of me like going to run the loop and then spending a bunch of time healing and then going to run that loop and then spending a bunch of time healing, that would have taken months. And I probably maybe would have never even got there. Yeah. But doing it this way was like these little baby steps. They felt silly at the time, but doing the reps over and over again, I actually got to my destination or my goal way faster than if I was going to jump there, jump into it and, and do it. It's so, a, yeah, that's a great example. Yes. I mean, the, the, the place where we fail mostly is we try to overdo things and then we end up stopping. And the example that you just gave is a great example where you make these small investments that compound over time and are, enormously successful, right? But it's it's hard for us, right? We want to get in shape now. We want to take a pill yeah. that all of a sudden we're in shape, you know? But it's really those minor investments and that, that pay off. And the thing, the cool thing about it is if you get to a point where you actually start embracing the, uh, whatever that tr struggle is, in your case, it was a psychological struggle. You could do it physically. But psychologically, you felt silly doing it, right? If you get to a place where you can embrace that struggle, um, and in some cases, it's a little bit of a physical struggle and so forth. In some cases, it's just patience. And um, then all of a sudden, you're in charge of it instead of it being in charge of you. But you have to embrace whatever there is right in front of you. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so in order to gamify life, let's, let's bring it back. Let's, it sounds like, a, a nice way to think about it would be one, you got to identify and get clear on what your level one is mm -hmm. under promise over to level on whatever that level one might be. And then two, I figure out a, a reward, right? Right. Make sure that level one at the end of level one, before you get to level two, there's something, some dopamine spike, right. Or some, something you get to do. Maybe it's traveling. Maybe it's, maybe it's a cheat day or I don't know, whatever it might be. Right. Yeah. So, it, and then, Right. And then, so let's talk about this a little bit more because there's some nuance to it. And so I'll, I'll okay. tell you, I think you and I have talked about it, but I'll, I'll tell you this uh, study again. It's a super simple study, but it's really important. Um, two, two groups of people, this is an exercise adherence program where they were seeing, they were asking people to go out and exercise, uh, specifically walk or run for 20 minutes a day. And the and there was a stimulus, which was the alarm going off. And then they saw their, uh, their running clothes or their exercise clothes right beside the bed. They were supposed to do this first thing in the morning. And then they were going to get dressed and go right then. So the stimulus was the clothes, the alarm in the clothes. Response was putting them on and going running or walking. And then they came back. Both groups did exactly that same thing. But one group would give themselves a piece of chocolate after they got done with their run and the other group, nothing. Right. And so 
you could probably guess that the group that got the chocolate afterwards tended to adhere to the exercise more than the other group. So basically they kept exercising and they were, they were better about it than the group that didn't get chocolate. So by itself, that's kind of cool. But the thing that was really cool is that they went back a year later after the study was over and that chocolate group still was exercising more than the other group. And so the idea is, and this is the piece most people miss, it's not just about stimulus and response. It's not just like, oh, I see my clothes, I need to go exercise. The reward piece becomes really critical in the beginning because that's what keeps the motivation. There's got to be some benefit. So you mentioned dopamine. Dopamine is a benefit in a lot of cases. It's a benefit for why we look at our you know, Instagram or TikTok and see if somebody has liked something that we put up, there's the, there's the dopamine, right? But it's not always that way initially, like in this exercise example. There's some people that just don't like exercise, but they feel like they should do it and they probably should. And so they need to create a reward around it. And so, but eventually you don't need the chocolate anymore because you've paired those two things together and now there, there is a dopamine hit because you know that there's something positive that results from the exercise. So, so to your point, you define your level, what that is, you define the reward, which becomes critically important. And over time, the success becomes its own reward. You can take away that piece of chocolate or whatever your reward happens to be, but you probably need it in the beginning to create the habits. Was there something special about chocolate that they chose? No, I think it's just random. It's, it's random. I'll tell you, I, I did, uh, I had a student one time who made cookies. This is really, uh, this was super cool to me. She was a pre-med student and, um, but we had done this, a uh, couple of lectures on, you know, following your passion and what you really love in life and all these kinds of things. It was pretty quiet. Uh, student. And, and one day she came up after class and she gave me this box of cookies. They were amazing. Best cookies I ever had in my whole life. And she said, you know, from class, she's decided that she's going to change her path. She's always wanted to bake and she's going to open her own bake shop. And these cookies are one of the things that she's going to be making. And so just as a thank you, she gave me these cookies. They were, <laughs> they were unbelievable. They were so good. And at the same time, I had been sort of struggling with taking my dogs on a walk on a regular basis. Like I'd get home late from work and I'd go, ah, I don't really feel like it and so forth. So I used a quarter of those cookies. Every time I would go out, I would take a quarter of the cookie and I would walk the dogs and eat the cookie. Right. That, that was my reward with it. And then it became easy to walk the dogs. You know, I found joy in the activity in addition to the cookie like that food a lot of times i mean even in animal studies right they they give them food they give them food pellets it's one of the most immediate reward things that you can do probably not a good idea of what your your goal is losing weight but you know for a lot of other things it's a really cool simple obvious reward for you so so no i don't think it's I mean, we know chocolate has stimulants and, and these kinds of things, but I don't think it was uniquely chocolate. I think it was the reward piece that became really important. Yeah. And I think, so something just clicked in my mind here. I remember there was a few times, one when I was like trying to get into running more. And another one was when I was making sure that I was doing uh, walking the dog twice a day. Um, I have a German shepherd and he gets, he goes wild in the house if I don't walk him twice a day. So you know, being out there and running and just being with yourself and running, that can be very meditative for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're hitting certain levels, it's, it's, it gets hard and it gets hard to do it over and over again and walking the dogs. You just reminded me of this. Um, what I did was I also wanted to get better at my net time. So I always had headphones, right? Always listening to audiobooks or always had a podcast or something that I was interested in or curious about. And my net time would usually be like cleaning, right? Or just doing something like that. But then obvious that's an obvious net time is walking the dogs or even going for a run mm -hmm. so when i paired this desire of me using my net time more valuable with the habit i was trying to build which was um, walking the dogs or going for a run i would put those earphones in 
and I would go walk the dogs and I would actually go longer. Like instead of it being a 10 minute walk or a 15 minute walk, I'd be out there for like 30 minutes because I'd be so into the audio book or the podcast I was listening to. Yeah. And then, so he got his exercise twice a day and same thing with running. Like I was looking forward I would get find myself looking forward to finishing the podcast I didn't start or finishing the book I didn't start on my run because it, it was just something that was on my mind for that day. So the next day I was like, well, I got to finish that book or I got to finish that podcast and it worked great. So I knocked out two with one, you know, two birds, one yeah, stone. Yeah, that's a fantastic example, right? You you have you sort of stumbled into the reward structure that's associated with the habit. And then, and eventually, uh, you, you may or may not do this, but eventually once you create enough momentum, you don't need the reward anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so, but when you pair those things, then all of a sudden they're, they're linked. This is, there's so many, so much science behind this. It's super cool that a lot of people have heard of Pavlov's dog where he yeah. would, you know, he would ring a bell and, and then the dog would start salivating because he would ring a bell the same time he gave the dog food. And eventually he could just ring the bell and the dog would start salivating, no food involved, right? It, those things are paired together. But, and, and so that one's pretty well known. The one that isn't is a guy named William James who did a, some really cool things that basically said, our physiology is paired with our emotion. And typically it's our emotion, at least early on, it's our emotion that starts to dictate our physiology. So for example, if I'm tired or bored or something, I may be sitting here like this and to reflect that. But if I, if I want to be excited about what we're doing, I just sit up and, and my body is now telling my brain, Hey, this must be exciting because he's sitting up, right? Cause those two things are paired together. And you're talking about the same exact thing. You're pairing together the podcast reward with the, the thing that you're trying to do, which is the walk and, and now both of them bring joy together and then you can separate those out and they still bring joy to you. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> the brain is amazing, man. It's so cool. Yeah, it's cool. And these behaviors that were, I mean, these are behaviors that were changing, right? And they happen through reps and that's why. So when I think about gamifying life, I think about all the facets of life, right? Everything, it, once you get to a certain point, you read enough books, maybe you listen to enough podcasts, you realize that you are pretty much like culture, entertainment, media, your friends, your family, your parents growing up, all these things has kind of like created who you are today, right? They're, they all had something to do with the way that your mind works, the behaviors that you've picked up. And eventually you get to that point where you know this, right? You know that your behavior, the things that you kind of, the things that are preventing you from being or doing something that you really want to do are programs like these things. This is just the brain plasticity, right? That we talk about. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that and actually knowing how to change it is two very different and even sometimes painful things in very much in my experience because knowing it is step one. And if we're talking about gamifying life, it's like level one of this life gamification is having the awareness to understand that you can rewind and repair or rebuild behavior. <clears throat> yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So now we're at like, kind of like in the game of life, if that's step one, step two is um, really like actually doing the work and doing the reps to actually change that behavior or build those habits or whatever you want to do. But there's just so many, you know, once you wake up one day and you're 30 years old and you're like, what the hell just happened? Like who, who, I didn't have anything to do with who I am. It just was culture. It was just my like, society, entertainment, whatever it was. And you have this desire to shift and create a life, right? Like lifestyle engineering is something that we, a term we use in Beanie and Blazer. Um, that's overwhelming, right? <laughs> so it's like, you have to start with your own level one of, just picking and choosing the things that are like the absolute most important. Like maybe it's health, maybe it's relationships, maybe it's um, fitness or, you know, reading intellectual pursuits, career finances, right? This gamifying thing applies to all of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's really, so two things, let me make just a general comment and then very specific around this topic of gamifying. I think if you're a conscious adult, most people 
know what they should be doing. They may not know all the details and all the nuances, but they generally know what you're supposed to be doing, right? You're supposed to be sleeping. You're supposed to be exercising. You're supposed to be, you know, minimizing certain things like alcohol and so forth, right? I mean, they know that. It's not the knowledge necessarily. It's as you're talking about, it's the reps. It's doing it, right? The action. Like I know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't necessarily do it all the time. That's not a knowledge situation. That's a rep situation. That's an action situation. And so one of the things that gamifying does is it makes the reps easier to do because they're not drills. They're not, you know, sort of forced tasks. They're fun things to do. So then now talking about it specifically, uh, number one actually is what's your goal, right? What's that goal that you have? which a lot of people, you know, put together goals, very, very few people actually execute on those goals in a consistent basis over time. Right. But, and, and again, part of it is because they think about the goals as being these, this thing that you have to be motivated, you have to be disciplined about and so forth. And unless you gamify it, that is true. But number one is your goal, whatever that happens to be. So, you know, we, we talked about, uh, the Maldives. I noticed a surfboard in the background, right? If I want to go to, uh, you know, Hawaii and go surfing, but I don't know how to surf, maybe my goal is to go to Hawaii and go surfing. And so that's the end state. Where am I now? Right. And now we get to, I'm at level one. And level one to me is say, I've never been on a surfboard. Okay. I remember the very first time I, I, uh, the very first surf lesson I ever took, I was on the beach on a surfboard standing there. Right. And, and the instructor was saying, or actually I was kneeling and the instructor was saying, here's how you stand up, which in a way you're like, I know how to stand up. I've done it for years. Right. But it's different on a surfboard. And so level one may have been just standing up on a surfboard, having that first lesson. And then what's my reward after I have that first lesson, right? But the thing is, I know the end, end goal. I know where I am. Now, what's the minimum amount that I can do that's going to move me towards that end goal? And that's my level one. And then what's the minimum amount I can do to move to level two or move to the next level? And that's my level two. And what's my reward at that minimum amount? This is the this is the place where people try to make mistakes. Instead of going, what's the minimum amount I can do to know I've achieved something? They're like, oh, I want to go here. And and because there's failure there, too much failure, they quit. Right. Or because it's too hard, they quit. They're like, screw this. I can't do it. They, you know, instead of uh, just sort of systematically moving in that direction, they quit because it's too, it gets too hard or they talk themselves out of the value of the goal or these kinds of things. But that minimum next level becomes important and you keep playing that game all the way along until you're surfing in Hawaii. Right? So there are steps to it as you go. It's kind of hard to give an actual formula to it in, in that what's a reward for you and what's a reward for me may be different. Yeah. But part of the fun is actually thinking through what the rewards are, right? I mean, it could be something as simple. When I get to level three, I'm going to go buy a Hawaiian shirt. I know for some reason we're talking about shopping a lot. I don't know why, but um, but I'm going to go buy a Hawaiian shirt, right? I, I don't know what it is that is going to motivate you, but whatever it is, do that, right? Have that as your level. And then it becomes fun. Then it's a game. So I, what I can see is if someone that's never done something like this before, and this is me like maybe even thinking back to my early 20s or so when I first read like a habit book or something, and I was like, okay, you got to start small. It almost feels like <clears throat> it, it's not worth it because you're not getting the results that you really want, right? So, it, and it's so small that it's just, you have this internal dialogue that this is stupid, mm -hmm. right? Just like those small steps you were taking. Just exactly. Yeah. Boom. Yep. That's right. But, but in the end it's, I guess, what is it like faith that you're going to keep going leveling up? Yeah. I mean, 
the, you know, I'll tell you, I heard this uh, story one time about this guy who wanted to study with a monk and he goes in, in Tibet and he knocks on the monk's door. You know, he's climbed up this long, long path and he's, he knocks on the monk's door and he says, I'd like to study with you. And the monk says, that's, that's great. Um, I've got a few things I'm doing right now. Here's a broom, sweep the path. And the guy's like, sweep the path. I don't want to sleep the path. I want to study with you. You know this story? He, he keeps, uh, and, and eventually the, and so the monk comes out and he says, uh, what are you doing? And the guy says, I'm sweeping the path because you told me to while I'm waiting to study with you. And he says, you're not ready. Keep sweeping the path. And this happens over and over and over again. And eventually the guy kind of forgets about studying because he, he's got this real joy and pride about how beautiful this path looks. And the, and the monk comes out and he says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm making this path beautiful. Look at it. And the guy, the monk says, now you're ready, right? And when you can get in the process, right? When you can find the joy and the, and the gratitude in the process, then all of a sudden, you know, those little bitty steps that you're taking are fun. They're cool. They're like, look at me. I get to do these little steps. And then all of a sudden, the cool thing is you look back just like this guy and you've got this whole path that you've swept and you've made beautiful. And now you're ready to go. The, the other way, you know, here's the thing. The other way doesn't work. And, and what most people, if they learn this, what most people learn is that it doesn't work, but they've had 10 years of it not working before they'll try the, this way that we're talking about. You know, just sweep, find joy in sweeping the path and don't worry about what it looks like. Don't worry about the success because you'll look back and you'll go, wow, I, that's a lot. I did a lot by a little bit every day. I love that. I love that story. I have heard that before. It's such a good story. And I think that like, <clears throat> that's like a great, it's a great place to start, especially coming off of 2020, right? Like we've already talked about this in a couple other podcasts, but I can't keep, I can't stop bringing it up. 2020 was rough. And it's trying to start a new year and a new life and, you know, trying to get back into gear. The best place to start is to be grateful. And I mean, it's, I know it's, it's used over and over and over and over and over again, right? Like every podcast is talking about it and they always say, just be grateful for now, like all that. But it's so true that it's sweeping the path. Like you need to love what you're doing before, because if you have that emotional tie to just discomfort of your current situation or whatever it might be, then you're going to have a really hard time moving up levels, right? Cause you're always going to have your, your eye and your mind on the future versus what's now what's present. Yeah. I mean, look, the, the reason that everybody's talking about gratitude is because gratitude is incredibly important, not just from a, a philosophical perspective, but from a neurophysiological perspective, gratitude is incredibly important. You know, if you start looking at things that you're grateful for, it changes us physically, right? It calms us. It uh, changes the blood flow, it the neural patterns, all of these different things, right? They're, so, you know, you're right. It's all over the place, but it's all over the place for a really, really good reason because it's so, so valuable about it. And you're also right. We're at the beginning of 2021. And, uh, you know, one of the things it's funny, but there's this sort of artificial reset button that we all have at the end of, at the beginning of a new year, new year, let's start again. <laughs> well, you could do it any day. You could do it any moment, but sort of as a society, we all decide to do it, you know, January 1st and so good. So let's use that as our marker, put the stake in the ground and move forward with it as well. Um, I just think that that you know any time that you want to put that stake in the ground and you say I'm going to start here I'm going to go there you, you give yourself a chance and and then if you make incremental progress towards that then you're going to be successful. I love that. That's a good analogy. You know, I, I think it was I can't remember who who said this and I'll kind of screw up the specific example, but, uh, if you were, you know, if you're 21 years old and you invest 
ten percent of your uh, of your income in the market, you'll be a multi millionaire by the time you're forty, something like that, right? Not that's not very much money when you're twenty one years old doing a you know a sort of a medium paying low paying job, but what happens is it compounds over time, and this is exactly what we're talking about. We're compounding, right? I, I'm not a gamer, but I, I will tell you, my son is, and you know, I've seen a lot of gamers. And one of the things that's really interesting, they'll spend hours playing. They'll get lost in the game and so forth. But if if they had to spend hours doing drills, just doing finger drills, for example, or you know, moving the cursor, whatever it is that's required in the game, if they had to spend hours doing drills, none of them would do it. Because mm-hmm. it'd be too hard, right? But when you can create a game out of it, whatever that happens to mean to you, then all of a sudden, you know, you've won the battle there. So making the investment in how can I gamify this? How can I create, you know, this this uh, response and reward structure for myself and maybe even do it with a partner? Now you've won the battle at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've experienced being on uh, like mobile game teams and seeing like the the um, strategy behind actually building like a mobile game and getting retaining users. And one of the biggest things also with the GDC and in GDC, the game developers conference, there's um, there's an entire part of it dedicated to gamification, like the actual science and the psychology and the neuroscience behind gamification and how the user onboarding for a game. And this isn't just mobile games. This is console games and everything. Um, is specifically designed to do exactly what we're talking about, to walk a, a player through these tiny little things that they need to do in order to be good at the game. So it might even be like the swing of a sword or um, just like opening up a catalog of some sorts and clicking on a few buttons. Like these things are very, very designed with neuroscience and psychology in mind because it's the way our brains work. And if they figured it out, like, there's no reason why we can't figure out how to apply it to life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by the science of gaming. Uh, it's because c- you're right. They figured it out. <laughs> They're amazing. The people who have figured this stuff out are amazing. You know, I mentioned Jesse Shell. He's he's one of the early, early uh, pioneers, at least as far as I know, on writing about this stuff. And it's fascinating, you know. And this is why this is one of the reasons why gaming is explosive right now and has been for a while. I mean, it's it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I think about when I think about gamifying life, there's there's a topic around in like New Year's time that a lot of people, I think, avoid. And it's funny because it's coming right after the holidays. And during the holidays, we are all around our family. We're all around like our close relationships and everything. And I don't know a single person that doesn't have some sort of friction or some sort of relationship issue, even with a boss or someone that you work with, you're going to holiday parties, you know, we all come off the back of those and then we get thrown back into this life with people and um, just relationships in our lives. But we never build our New Year's resolution to improve relationships. I very rarely will hear someone say, I want to improve the relationships in my life, or I want to make incremental improvements with this one person that just won't go away. Maybe it's a family member because they're not going anywhere, right? You got to love them for who they are. So um, that being said, I think that gamifying, I guess the question I have is, how can I apply gamification to relationships? It's, a, yeah, it's a great question. And it's, it really, I mean, you can apply it to anything, but relationships are a really cool way to apply it, right? I, I don't know that we're going to talk about it a lot, but you, you and I have talked about this idea of season, reason, lifetime, right? So there are people who are in your, uh, in your life for some reason, uh, there's something that you need to learn from that relationship. It's really short and, you know, it, it could even be a single encounter, a season, which is a little bit longer, maybe months or even a couple of years. And then, uh, a lifetime is much, much longer. So, so one of the games is I want to engage with this person to see if I can figure out whether the season reason or lifetime, right? That becomes the game. And so you, you, uh, you start doing that to see if you share values. You start doing that to see if you can, part of the game is finding out something unique about that person and, and so forth. And then it's really not about that person. It's about 
you having a game within this. This sounds a little bit cold because it's kind of like, well, I'm sort of using that person for my own game. But if the end goal is you wanting to improve yourself and you wanting to potentially improve that relationship, it serves that goal to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. But here, here's the thing, you know, in any relationship, uh, we've talked about this before, in any relationship, you're only 50% responsible, right? But you're 100% responsible for that 50%. So how do I deal with my 50%? So I'm not trying to manipulate that other person. I'm not trying to, if they like me or don't like me, that's really not my business, but I can do my best and my 50%. And that's where the game is with me. You know, how do I engage? How do I uh, get involved with this? And, you know, when I, uh, you know, aunt Sally always ends up trying to one up everybody, right? Whoever aunt Sally is. So here's the game. I want to, I'm just going to count how many times she does it. Okay. Now that seems maybe a little bit cruel until you start thinking about it. But to do that, that means I have to pay attention to aunt Sally. And when I'm paying attention, maybe I discover in that it's, it's her insecurities that requires that. And so instead of me being upset with her, maybe I have a different perspective and I can talk to her at a different level. Right. So it opens some things up that maybe wouldn't be opened up if I went in with this negative attitude about, oh, Aunt Sally's going to try and one up somebody. Right. And so there are ways that you can think through this that turn out to be the benefit of everybody. And some of it is you just go into the the relationship with a little bit different attitude, a, maybe a more open attitude to be able to, you know, have that have conversations that you didn't have before. That's so interesting. So maybe level one, because I love I love what you said about a relationship is 50% and 50%, 50% you, 50% the other person. So I feel like a level one of that game, you kind of have to include both of those. So there's probably some behavior that you have that maybe you can just be aware of, right? That's level one. What's a behavior or a reaction that you, you apply to a certain stimulus? Um, that's level one. Just be aware of it. Don't get mad at yourself. Don't like, right. Don't feel guilty about it or anything like that. Just be aware of it. And on the other side, exact. I love that. Just counting someone's behavior or whenever they disagree with you, right. Being around disagreeable people can be really frustrating. So simply just being aware and counting it could help you, um, I guess even drive a little bit more empathy because you're paying attention to that person a little bit more. Cause what we'll probably do if we identify our behaviors, we're probably avoiding that person. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> So then we realize that while we're avoiding that person that keeps being very disagreeable, which their disagreeableness is the thing that you know, maybe gives them some sort of uh, attention, right? Because you're avoiding them and you realize that there's this circle going on right? and that awareness piece is level one and then level two, yeah. you can start adding in. And then in Aunt Sally's case, maybe the reason that she's trying to one up is because she wants to impress you because she, she likes you and she wants you to like her. Right. But you right. don't discover that if you're just, you know, battling against her the whole time. Right. And so, yeah, then level two may be, OK, what can I do to, to engage Aunt Sally at this empathetic level that you just talked about? And mm -hmm. and, you know, on and on. And, it, and so it becomes kind of a game. It becomes a fun way to think about how can I interact? How can I handle my 50 percent better? And ultimately, that's what it's about, right? And Sally may be always a one-upper, but how do I handle my 50%, right? What do I do with that? And that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, and that's 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 probably the, that's the hardest part for people. Because even being, being aware of your own behavior, because you know when you're around people that grind your gears, you act and behave a different way than you and your own people that don't. Absolutely. Yeah, you right. walk into that situation with an attitude. I I knew a person one time who, for whatever reason, every time we talked, she would say things that were uh, contradictory, even if she agreed. So I could say, hey, it's a beautiful day today. The sky's blue. And she's like, no, it's it's a blue sky today. And I would think, what? we just said the same thing. Why did you just disagree with me? And for a while, it just 
as you said, grinded on me, right? I thought of several words to say here, but it just grinded on me. And, and then I started kind of playing this game, right? And observing her with other people as well. And it turns out it wasn't about me at all. That was her thing. For whatever reason, that was her thing. And so then it became a little bit funny to me that she would do it. And, and I was able to let go of whatever the first word that came out of her mouth was, which was generally no or something negative. And then the rest of what she said may be of interest and we could build on that. So it's almost like some people will say, um, or, uh, or okay, or something. She would say, no, I don't know why, but she did. But I took it personally initially. But once I real, I started playing the game and started paying attention at a different level, at, you know, you could play this game of counting how many times she says no. It's not just no to me. Oh, she's saying it to everybody. So this isn't personal, right? So it helps you sort of open up your mind around it because naturally we become defensive. We become offended sometimes by this. It may have nothing to do with us. And it's really easy to make it about you because typically it's something that's going to get your ego going a little bit too. Like it's going to get that defense, like someone that's disagreeable or that decides that they want to, I don't know, have a very condescending tone even, right? No one likes that. <laughs> it sucks. So obviously you're going to protect yourself and what your ego has been doing your whole life is protecting you and that creates some sort of behavior. That's right. That's so, absolutely. Yeah, I, I always, one of those things that I, it's like an ongoing thing. I probably say it to myself daily is that you can't control other people. You can only control yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I, so mine, very similar to that. I've had, uh, from some experiences that I've had that were really, really difficult. Um, I, I put myself in these situations, but it was on a yoga mat, right? And the, the phrase that I kept saying, keep saying still to this day is stay on your mat, right? Don't worry about what's going on around you. Just stay on your mat and do what you need to do. Stay and, on your mat. Yep. Yeah like that it's helped me a lot i can tell you yeah good stuff i think we tackled a lot of it here i mean it, this is a topic that i think we can we can talk about forever right there's so many facets of life that we can add gamification to but it's 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 more than that it's like values and deciding how you want to show up like a lot of that is just knowing how you want to show up before you can even start gamifying it, knowing what you want, getting clarity on it, getting clarity on your goals, whatever it might be. Right. Right. So this, this stems out, I think everywhere, right. <laughs> All facets of trying to like live a very purposeful life. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it is. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's building a system so that you can do it in a smart way without, you know, bludgeoning yourself every time you want to go on a diet or something like that. Right. Yeah. And I've done it the hard way. I know we've all probably done it the hard way. I have. And sometimes it takes doing it the hard way to start doing it the smart way. Right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, life's fun, isn't it? Yeah. I, I will. I just want to tell you this one quick thing. I, I read this one time and I'm going to paraphrase it, but it basically said when a lesson is presenting itself in the first place, it whispers. And then if you don't pay attention to it, it just is, gets a little bit louder. And eventually it will start shouting at you so that you can't ignore it. Our job, if we want to have a, a life of grace and ease, is to listen to the whispers. I'm not very good at listening to the whispers, right? And so one of the things I want to do in my life is get better at hearing the whispers. So it doesn't, I don't have to make those mistakes and I don't have to make it hard. I can live life with grace and ease. That's awesome. I love that. And that's, is that, would you include like kind of paying attention to the shoulds part of that? I mean, that goes back to even where we start in level one, identify the shoulds. Wouldn't that be a nice place? And then um, when it comes to, we talk about people and relationships, reason, season, and lifetime, there's... I believe that there's a lesson in all life's experiences that all the people in your life, you can, there's something you can learn from. There's a lesson in all of it. Right. And it's easy to, that's why I love what you just said, because 
reason, season, and lifetime, we, you can, if you pay attention to those whispers and you pay attention to the, to the lessons in there, then you'll be able to identify where people fit in those categories, right? Yeah. And, and a lot of that, you know, use your gut. Your gut is, mm -hmm. is a supercomputer. So, yeah, absolutely. That is a whole nother topic, right? Yeah. I would love to get into that one next time. Yeah. Next time we get into that. Cool, man. Well, that was awesome. This has been a great podcast. I, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, you're very welcome. You. It's super fun as always talking to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for listening to the episode and Beanie and Blazer Radio. Stay tuned for more episodes released every Wednesday. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave a review on one of your favorite listening platforms. It makes a huge difference for us and we would be very, very grateful for it. Um, for more resources, you can visit the Beanie and Blazer website at beanieandblazer.com and follow us on social media. Just simply type in Beanie and Blazer in your social, social search bar. And there's tons of awesome content that'll be posted daily for you and tons of awesome content that's posted all the time on the Beanie and Blazer website. Thank you. Be awesome. Onward and upward. Till next time, take care.